The answer is Guild Wars 2. But there's a slight catch. You see, about halfway through the series, I realized I was asking the wrong question, kinda. There's nothing wrong with asking what's the best MMORPG for casual players. I just stumbled upon a better way to phrase the question to remove some of the subjective factors and allow us to reach a more objective conclusion. Any MMORPG can be played casually to some degree, and your own personal preferences will do more to help you find the right game for you than anything I could say in this video. But what if you heavily value the MMO part of the acronym? Suddenly I realized the question I really wanted to ask was which MMORPG feels most like an MMORPG when played casually? Before we begin, I think it's important that we discuss what separates a casual player from a hardcore or even average player. I, I think it comes down to three things. You may disagree, but here are my thoughts. Time. A casual player is not likely going to have much time to commit to playing and learning about the game. They need the game to respect their time, allow them to play in short bursts, and give them a consistent feeling of accomplishment and character growth. Effort. A casual player is not going to be researching builds or skill rotations. They're not going to look into every mechanic. They're going to take the game as it is presented to them, and not much more than that. Social proclivity. There's probably a better term for this, but that's the best I can come up with. A casual player is not looking to participate in structured group content. The thought of entering an LFG lobby gives a casual player anxiety. Any interactions with other players needs to be dynamic, zero stress, and zero commitment. Another thing worth mentioning, casual players don't care about the end game when choosing an MMO. Many players have disagreed with me on this, and that's okay, but I firmly believe it. Casual players aren't concerned with what the game will be like after 20 or more hours. What they are concerned with is the value that the first 20 hours will bring them. To be clear, I'm not saying that a casual player will never be interested in endgame content. The ability for casual players to participate in and enjoy endgame content is a totally different question that I am not equipped to answer. What I do know is that they will never make it to the endgame if the game isn't good for them at the beginning. The early game experience matters a lot to casual players. The game needs to respect their time from the beginning. Because of this, this series is solely focused on the early game. There are likely going to be mechanics in some games that I didn't experience in my playtime, and veterans could easily say, well, Kyle, at level 30, you gain access to the Iron Beak Ravine, where you can spend your honor quills to participate in the Hero's Crest Trials of Valor. Here's the thing. That's not my problem. I wish the developers had included that mechanic earlier in the game. Now for this series, I collected a lot of data and I'll have a link to the spreadsheet in the description. My hope was that I would be able to point to the data and show why a certain game was better for casual players. Unfortunately and hilariously, the one mechanic that became the deciding factor was not something I tracked. The good news is that's going to make this video a whole lot shorter. If you do take a look at the spreadsheet, it's worth mentioning that it's only about 90 to 95% complete. As I reached the end of the series, I realized none of the data was helping me make my decision and adding new games was kind of a headache. So you'll notice that there's some, there's some data toward the end that wasn't collected. I probably should have, but it's just not what was best for me at the time. So if none of the data I collected helped me determine a winner, what did? Well, Final Fantasy XIV has the Fate system, open world events that pop up from time to time, allowing players to cooperate to complete the event together. There is no need to group up or communicate with each other. Unfortunately, in my time with the game, I didn't really have a great experience with the Fate system. I participated in it once with another player, but I think they left before it ended. But. I don't know. It's there though, and I know it's used more in higher level areas, but I just can't speak much toward it other than the system is there and it is used, just not in a way that allowed me as a new player to participate in it much. New World has a similar system to this, though I'm not really sure what it's called. I stumbled upon it for the first time in episode 9. Myself and a few other players defended a farm supplies against some attackers. It was really fun and I'd love to see more of it in the game. 
I think World of Warcraft has open world objectives that are progressed by anyone in the area, but it wasn't at all obvious to me when it was happening. I noticed in a later episode that there was a bonus objective for the area I was in, and the completion bar seemed to be progressing when I wasn't actively doing anything. It's possible that all bonus objectives are like this and I just didn't notice, but honestly, if I didn't notice, then it doesn't really count for much. Albion Online has dungeons and other dungeon-like areas scattered around the world, both fixed and dynamic. I'm not sure if all of them work this way, but I did have an experience where another player followed me into a dungeon and we completed it together. It wasn't quite the same as the other systems, but it was fun and stress-free. And as far as I'm aware, that's about it. No other MMOs offered me opportunities for dynamic, cooperative, open-world content. Simply battling the same enemies with other players in the same area isn't enough. I want to feel like I'm working with the other players to progress the world, the story, and my character. When it comes to dynamic, cooperative, open-world content, Guild Wars 2 is in another league. Nine minutes into my first Guild Wars 2 video of this series, I was introduced to dynamic group content. In the opening tutorial, I was instructed to defend the door to a castle. I watched and waited as waves of enemies approached. Another player joined in, and we completed the event and the events that followed together. We weren't individually working on our own kill counters. We weren't waiting on our own timers to go off so that we could progress through the door and continue the tutorial. We were in the world, working together. We weren't in a group. We didn't plan it. It just happened. In episode 12, I stumbled upon a champion that randomly spawns. It's not the sort of enemy you want to tackle by yourself. Another player was nearby and wrote about the champion in chat, asking if anyone wanted to fight it. I simply stood in the area and waited. Within a few minutes, we had a group of four players attacking the champion together. We didn't form a group. No one cared who was tanking or healing. Everyone got their own loot. There was no stress. It just happened naturally. Now, these two types of examples, these experiences happen all the time in Guild Wars 2. And as cool as these experiences are, nothing compares to what happened to me in episode 5. What is going on over here? What? Oh. Oh, the Shadow Behemoth. That's what the... Oh no, I hope I'm not too late. Can I get in on this? Oh snap. Okay, that was really cool being able to see it from so far away and hear it from so far away. That was pretty epic. Go Guild Wars 2, that's a win. That is a huge win. That was really cool. I have never experienced that quite like that because normally when I do something like this, I'm, I'm going to it very intentionally. There I was, less than three hours into this character and I stumbled upon a world boss. I hadn't even unlocked all of my skill slots and I found myself participating in and succeeding in a large event with countless other players. There was no group finder involved. No one cared how well I was doing. It was pure, large-scale MMORPG combat, and I did nothing to make it happen except respond to a sound I heard in the distance. If you are a casual player and you value the MMO in MMORPG, Guild Wars is the best game for you. That being said, I put too much work into this series to leave it at that. So let's talk about the other games. I'll be loosely ordering them from the worst to best based on my own personal casual enjoyment and only moderately take into account how much they feel like an MMO when played casually. Bringing up the rear is RuneScape. RuneScape is really good at what it does and what it is. And I really enjoy some of what it is, but not most. I think my problem is that the world feels like a game and not like an actual living world. It's also way more limiting as a free player than I understood it to be. Next up is Star Wars The Old Republic, which is an incredibly frustrating game for me. If you really like Star Wars and you've already played all the other classics like KOTOR and KOTOR 2, this one is worth trying. But otherwise, I can't recommend it. The story and voice acting are amazing, but the game does not respect the player's time at all. It starts off okay, 
But before too long, you're just walking really long distances to just move the story forward. And then you're just walking right back to where you came from. The fast travel system needs a complete overhaul and the beautiful world just feels lifeless and pointless when it comes to the actual gameplay. Number eight is Guild Wars 1, which is a game I can only really recommend to Guild Wars 2 players who haven't played it before. I think they should, but the lack of jump and the frustrating movement is just too much to ignore. However, if the idea of playing an MMO with a group of NPCs tagging along with you, if that appeals to you, it's worth a try. Number seven is World of Warcraft, and it's only this low on the list because of the cost. If cost isn't a concern for you, give it a shot. The writing is excellent, the quests are super creative, the world is incredibly well made. It's just too expensive to recommend to casual players. It's technically a better game than many of the other games on this list, but I can't ignore the monthly subscription. Number six is Lotro. Now, here's the deal with this. If you've read the Lord of the Rings books more than once, you just need to stop this video and go install Lotro and try it. It's really rough around the edges, but it's a beautiful depiction of Middle Earth. And if if you're a if you're a fan that loves Lord of the Rings enough to read the books more than once, you should at least give this game a try. Number five hurts me. As a game, Elder Scrolls Online is fun enough. The voice acting and the writing is the best of any game on this list. The animations are super stiff, and the combat is lackluster at times, but the biggest problem is it never once felt like an MMO. But if you love The Elder Scrolls and its lore, you should definitely pick this up on a sale because there is so much content to play through and just so much lore to dig into. Number four is Albion Online, and I'm shocked. I would have never thought this would have been this high on the list. It's a lot of fun and one of the more unique games on the list. It is not at all what I expected, and you'll get a lot of different descriptions from players as to like what it is. Uh, it's an amazing game to relax and play while you're watching something else or sitting on the toilet since it's also on mobile. Uh, once you finish the tutorial, there is no story. It's just gameplay. Fighting enemies, grinding for resources, crafting better gear. They've stripped the game down to nothing but a gameplay loop, and it's actually kind of refreshing. I'm mad at myself for not trying Star Trek Online sooner. I'll admit, it's only this high on the list because I'm a pretty big Star Trek fan. If I were a big Lord of the Rings fan, these games would likely switch places. And let's be clear though, Lord of the Rings Online is way rougher around the edges than Star Trek Online, though Star Trek Online isn't exactly polished. But Star Trek Online is really unique. The ship combat is fun. And once you switch from the RPG controls to the shooter controls, which you absolutely should do, it becomes an incredibly fun experience. It has an insane amount of different species you can choose from. And I'm really looking forward to playing as a Ferengi. Number two on our list is Final Fantasy XIV. The love Final Fantasy XIV players have toward their game is justified. It is a well-polished, feature-filled, and broadly appealing game that I think everyone should try. Don't let anyone tell you that the Final Fantasy XIV free trial is only up to Stormblood as if that's a few hours of content. WoW's free trial is slightly heavier than the shadow created by Final Fantasy XIV's trial. It also has arguably the most welcoming community of any MMO, and I think pretty highly of Guild Wars 2's community. My only complaint is the lengthy and often obnoxious dialogue that you have to read. And that leaves us with number one. And as shocked as I was that Albion was number four, I'm even more shocked that New World is number one. New World gets a bad rap. I see comments all the time throwing New World under the bus, I find it incredibly refreshing and an enjoyable experience. The combat is fluid and fun. The story and setting are unique. The voice acting is good and never overstays its welcome. The sound design and music are amazing. The UI is sublime. I love the weapon skill trees and how character progression works. I honestly don't know if I can say anything negative about New World. I'm not really aware of how the community is toward new players, but I've never noticed any red flags. I've heard veterans aren't happy with the current end game, but that doesn't really matter to me. By the time I reach the end game, I will have had more than enough fun to justify the cost of the game. Because of all of this, I'm really looking forward to the new Lord of the Rings MMO that this team is working on. It's also worth mentioning that New World was so good, I decided to release this video out before I had technically given it the full 16 episode treatment that I had planned on. 
because I, I already know I like it enough to put it at number one. And it's the one game on this list that I'm really looking forward to continuing the videos of. The other games, some of them have a chance at returning occasionally, maybe on streams, but New World is 100%. That series is continuing. And with that, we've reached the end of this filthy casual competition. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey, and maybe we'll revisit this idea in the future after more games have been released.